Carl, thank you very much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. Um, could you take a moment to introduce yourself to our video audience? Yeah, my name is Carl Binder, and I uh, currently live in Bainbridge Island uh, near Seattle, Washington. Um, I have a consulting firm. Our group has recently renamed the Performance Thinking Network, and we do work all over the world. We work with large companies, mostly in America, but also in Korea and Europe and sometimes Latin America. What was your first exposure to HPT or whatever it was called back in the day? And if you could bring up uh, some of your educational background and some of the famous people that you've been associated with in the past. Well, I suppose strictly speaking, it was my first contact with B.F. Skinner. Uh, I was, when I was an undergraduate, I, I actually wrote him an enthusiastic letter about one of his books, and he wrote me back. And then when I was uh, moving from one graduate school to another, he actually invited me to come and be a graduate student there at Harvard. And so I was an experimental, uh, experimental psychology student at Harvard for some years, but I was really interested in application. Um, and, and I didn't, although I knew about applications of behavior science to instruction in particular and therapy and so forth, I certainly didn't know about HPT until some years later. Uh, I spent 10 years uh, as associate director of a learning research lab in the 70s, but its focus was really special education. And so we did instructional design there we developed what later we called the fluency building approach to instruction. Uh, and I began to make contact also with measurement uh, methods that we continue to use in organizations, not just in education. I think my first actual contact with HPT was when somebody gave me Tom Gilbert's uh, book, uh, Human Competence, shortly after it was published, probably 1979. And <clears throat> I got very excited about it. And that was just as I was kind of moving into, I was moving out of the education world because we developed some really powerful instructional methods. But unfortunately, the education system was not very receptive at the time to, to such things. So one of my mentors, Ogden Lindsley, suggested that I move into corporate, sort of the corporate world as another laboratory, essentially. So I did that kind of naively, not knowing a lot about how to sell and market myself in particular. But I started a consulting firm, and within about a year or so of that, I discovered the organization called then NSPI. And so I think I came to my first conference in the early 80s. And at that point, even before that, I contacted Pat Patterson, who was, a, who was kind of a protege of Joe Harless. Uh, I began to, at that time, I lived in Boston. And so I, I met a bunch of colleagues there, and I got involved in the ISPI chapter, NSPI in those days chapter. And then I started coming to the national conferences and sort of it exploded from there pretty much. Can you, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of your biggest influences like Og Lindsay and others, but who would you attribute uh, those in the society or outside the society who have had a major influence on your thinking about uh, human performance technology? Well, Gilbert was very much the, the, my principal influence early on. And it's, the thing that struck me about him when I read that book, besides the fact that Human Competence is one of those books where there's more ideas than kind of most people can use in a lifetime. And it's not an easy book, and I, mine is dog-eared. I mean, I still go back to it sometimes. But what struck me about Gilbert was he took all the behavior science that I learned about in graduate school and actually applied in, in educational settings, and with uh, especially the focus on accomplishments, uh, that we now call work outputs, but the same idea, the products of behavior, shifting away from behavior, uh, because that's what's valuable, valuable in the organization, and also his behavior engineering model. Those two things, and maybe the uh, potential for improving performance, the notion of looking at exemplary performance and trying to identify what the really best practices are, those things had a huge impact on me early on. And so Tom was a big influence. He not only, not only his book, but then I got to know him a bit. We invited him to Boston, got to meet him and his partner and wife, Marilyn Gilbert. And so they, they, as long as Tom continued to live, he was a big influence on the way I thought about things. But some of the other influences, of course, Ogden Lindsley I'd known before that. And Ogden was an influence on me really uh, from the early 70s. And he'd been involved in ISPI or NSPI before that, and then he wasn't involved for quite a few years. I think I actually got him back into the society a little bit. But he influenced me because of his focus on measurement, his standard acceleration charting, um, and also his work that led to an understanding of what we call fluency, the notion that if you're looking at skills and knowledge, you should be looking at the time dimension and how quickly and easily people perform, not just how accurately. So he was, of course, a big influence, and then when I sort of got him to come back to the conferences, we usually spent a lot of time together there. 
Uh, Don Tosti is a big influence. Yeah, I learned a lot from him about culture, values and practices, uh, and other things, but that was one of the big things I learned from Tom, uh, excuse me, from Don. Um, who, what other people have been really big? Joe Harless. I spent a lot of time with Joe Harless. He, I went through his courses. Um, he, in a way, what Joe taught me, beside what it really means to be accomplishment-based, um, is, is how to turn this into a business. You know, he was, he was successful, I think, in taking his, his instructional design work and his performance improvement work and particularly job aids and front-end analysis and commercializing it. And for me, you know, the interest has always been, this is great science, I love this work, but we need to change the world. And so, in a certain way, Tom, excuse me, uh, uh, Joe Harless and some of the other, some of our other colleagues, but particularly Joe, provided a model of, of how we turn this into a business to pay for our work, basically. Um, Roger Kaufman, another big influence. Uh, Roger, I know, is well known for a lot of things, but his focus on mega, on societal goals and aligning what we're doing with societal goals has, has, been, has inspired me in a lot of ways. So there's probably others, but those are some of the big ones. Any favorite books or articles that you might suggest to those who are at the entry point mm -hmm. of HPT? Well, that's a good question. Um, human competence is a tough read. Human, and I'm not sure a, that's the place to start. It is a tough read. Right? I think it's an excellent book. I'm, you know, I'm somebody who kind of prefers to read your original sources, and it might be because I come from a somewhat academic background. Um, I think Tom's book is very well written. I think that it is something that almost anybody can read. It's just a lot of stuff. Um, my influences, frankly, have been people and workshops more than they have been books. For example, I think anybody in our field should go take a seminar in information mapping. Uh, Bob Horn, by the way, who is another Gilbert Award winner and who uh, was one of my mentors really early on and still a good friend, he developed the information mapping method. And so, for me, that way of, analy as he says, analyzing, organizing, and presenting information um, makes an enormous impact and it not only is useful as a technology but the information types for example in, in the information math, mapping method help to understand, help me in instructional design, they help me in thinking through the kinds of information people need in any situation. So I would recommend people go to that workshop, uh, those workshops. Uh, I would recommend, I'm not sure what's available these days to learn about job aids. There's a few good job aid books that I've seen uh, in the bookstore and sort of reviewed. I think those are worth looking at. I think uh, currently um, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, Roger Kaufman has some very good books on needs analysis and strategic planning. Um, the new series, frankly, the new, the, even though it's an expensive set of books, the new ISPI series um, has a bunch of chapters in it, many of which are very practical, some of which are more academic, but there's some very useful things in there. I don't, I probably don't, I should have at the tip of my tongue some good books to recommend, but that's about as far as I can think at the moment. Well, very good. Thank you for that. Um, can you share with us uh, one or two stories about uh, HPT type projects that you've been involved in? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, actually there's different, there's a couple things at the project level. Uh, I, I worked for about 15 years focused almost completely in, in the sales area. But um, unlike a lot of people who focus on the sales process, we were focused on focusing on what people sometimes call sales knowledge. And this really started in uh, um, the early 80s and we were doing this work on fluency in which we focus we developed very structured practice activities to help people get actually literally fluent on things and so somebody asked me if we could do uh, product knowledge with that and so I didn't know much about product knowledge but what I did is a front-end analysis and what I learned was that the way that most people do product knowledge for salespeople doesn't make much sense from a performance point of view because usually what they do is they dump features and benefits on salespeople. On the one hand, the salespeople are taught that the way they should perform is to identify the needs and problems of their customers, and then they should help to solve them. And then they go to the product marketing people who just dump features and benefits on them, so they become sort of technical tellers about their products instead of effective salespeople. So what we recognize is we need to change, restructure the information so that it was about the problems and needs that the products could address, so that salespeople would learn about that and learn how to probe for that. And then they would learn enough about the products and services, but not just sort of how cool they were, but rather how they addressed those needs. 
So we developed a model for that originally in banks when we were taking, uh, in the 80s when we were, banks were being deregulated and they were, they were now having to turn their loan officers into salespeople. So we enabled salespeople with the right knowledge and, the, and making it fluent also mm -hmm. to, uh, to probe for needs, to suggest solutions, um, and, and it really made a big difference. It made a difference to the, to, the, to the extent that we published an article about the early work and that led to a company. Uh, and so for about almost 15 years, we worked with major companies, mostly on product launches, where they needed to have salespeople fluent on what the trends and issues were in the marketplace that affected their customers, what their customers' business issues were, what kinds of problems they might have, how their products could address those problems, how their products could address those problems better than the competitors. And the thing is, we built these knowledge resources and training and coaching tools based on a description of sales performance. So for me, that was not just as a single project, but actually an exercise over quite a few years an opportunity to learn a lot about what we often call the accomplishment-based approach, where you, know, you define the sales process in terms of the milestones or the outputs that the salesperson has to produce at each step along the way, and then you say, what do they got to do? What's the behavior for that? And then you say, okay, what are all the things we need to put in place? What are the expectations and feedback? What tools do they need? Especially knowledge type tools. You know, what reward and recognition, et cetera. You, you then do a systematic analysis of what needs needs to be in place to support that. So that was a series of projects that was almost like a laboratory. Uh, and, we've, and, and in the process, we learned things. One specific example that I, that I think is worth mentioning, people talk a lot about exemplary performance in this field. And um, the idea is that if you can identify people who produce outputs or results at a considerably higher level than everybody else, and if you can figure out what the small bits of behavior are that make that difference, then you can help other people. Maybe not achieve that level, but get, let's say, halfway to that level. Mm -hmm. And that, that has a lot of economic value. So we, in the sales world, did a lot of that kind of work. And one of my favorite examples, it, it was really classic. We were working with Dun & Bradstreet in, in a sales organization. And it was telesales, and so they were on the phone. And there was this one woman in Chicago who had a close ratio, which was almost twice as high as anybody else. And what that means is, of the number of people she called on the phone, she sold almost twice as many something. And what she was selling was, was, was marketing information, stuff like mailing lists and, and labels and background information about companies and so forth. And so, we, so finally, we were, we were working to develop a group of people at, at, at Dun & Bradstreet called Sales Performance Consultants. And we were teaching them about basically about performance analysis, even though they had been, they'd been uh, district managers. So at some point in that process, we had identified this obviously exemplary performer, and everybody had all kinds of theories about this lady, like, oh, she must have a lot better skills, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, they said, we're going to go and observe her. So they went out, and, and, they, and they sat down with her in, her in her workspace, and the way this salesperson's, this job starts is you get a set of lead sheets. You get a seat of a set of pieces of paper that have contact information for the company, they have the standard industrial code, which is the kind of business it is, they have other stuff about the company. And they were selling to small and medium sized companies, so a lot of times it would be you know, small service firms, retail shops, you know, uh, whatever, uh, hardware stores, lawyers, essentially small and medium sized businesses. So. They handed her a stack, of, uh, a stack of these lead sheets and said, okay, show us what you do. Because one of the things I learned from Gilbert and others is we really need to observe people's behavior if we can. Because if you ask an expert what they do, they usually can't tell you because they're very unconsciously competent. So anyway, we hand her this pile of lead sheets. She sorts them into two piles. She takes one pile and puts it over on the side of her, ta of her desk, takes the other pile and says, okay, let me show you. And they said, wait a minute. What did, what's the deal? What, what did you do there? And she says, oh, oh, well, look, these are all pizza stores and I forget, two or three other kinds of companies. She says, I never sell anything to them. I don't even call them. So it was like this big lightning bolt. We realized that that one little step that she would not have told us about if we hadn't asked probably accounted for the whole rest of the result. And in fact, as we looked at it, we recognized she pretty much did it the same way everybody else did. But when we helped other people do that one step, which was qualifying essentially what kind of company she would call on, it, it dramatically increased everybody else's close ratio. 
So I love that as an example of the exemplary performance thing. Excellent. Thank you. Do you have a 30-second elevator speech type thing that you use to explain to people what you do or what HPT is that you could share with our audience? We do. And in fact, we've been working on this quite a bit, just as a little background. I think as, as performance improvement people, we are so excited about our own stuff that we often talk about that first. But what I've learned in the last year or so is what I say, my elevator speech is, we help organizations improve productivity and, pro and, and profitability per employee and maximize employee engagement. And then if you want to know how, then we can tell you all kinds of things about performance improvement. But the front end of it is about the customer, about what we can do for the organization. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Do you have a current focus for, and any activities that you're doing for your professional, your own professional development, your own learning uh, in this field? Well, to be honest, most of my learning over the years, beside learning from my colleagues and mentors, of whom there are many in ISPI and in this field, has been from my clients and the people that I'm working with and my teams and so forth. And so um, I'm slightly shifting the answer to your question, I think. But what we're doing right now is we've just recently renamed our business the Performance Thinking Network. And what that's about is we have this simple set of models, the performance chain and the six boxes model, and a set of tools which are designed intentionally to be both simple and very plain English. And what we find is that we can not just teach performance professionals with this, but we work with managers and supervisors and executives. And the big idea is to get everybody, or at least some critical mass of people in an organization, thinking about performance in a way that's consistent with our what we know in HPT from research. So what's interesting about that, and the reason the word network is in the name of our business, is what we've learned is that because these are fairly simple concepts and fairly simple models, we can introduce them to people and they will start applying them in new and interesting ways. And I am learning so much from my clients who come back to me with new things I never would have thought about. Um, that we then take and try and we learn something more, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of a network, I'm excited because it's been happening for years, but now we're really trying to crank it up. The notion of creating a hopefully global community of practice who share pretty much the same language and models and some tools, some knowledge management and some social networking tools to share that, this is where I'm getting most of my learning now. I'm ba it's basically like creating a big laboratory and letting you know, letting the, lab, letting the people, letting the clients teach me. Mm -hmm. So in the process, I learn a lot of stuff. You know, I, I, I then I'll call a colleague. I, before Gary Rumler passed away, you know, I'd call him periodically and just share stuff and ask him things, or I'd, or I'd talk to Don Toasty. But honestly, most of my professional development right now is, is coming from my clients. Tell, tell me a little bit more about the, the your rebranding your business mm -hmm. okay. and your, your coming out with what, new products and services? What can you tell yeah. us about those? Well, the history of that, <clears throat> there's probably some background that's relevant. I don't want to get too talkative here. But the, okay. you know, the background is that when I first learned Gilbert's uh, six bo or, uh, his uh, behavior engineering model back in the early 80s, we found it really powerful because we at that time were focusing mostly on instruction, which is sort of the bottom, is he called it knowledge. And what we recognized is obviously what kind of performance improvement people recognize now pretty universally, is that in order to make training effective, we got to be sure that the environment that the trained people move back into supports that new performance, whatever it is. So you got to look at, you know, what their expectations are, what tools they have and all that. Well, we started using Gilbert's model, and Gilbert's model has words in it which are, um, which are uh, data, um, uh, instruments, incentives, knowledge, capacity, and motives. Now those are not bad words, but a number of them, like instruments for example, if you put in front of a regular plain English person, it's pretty hard to understand. So what we found was this was a great tool, but if we started to use it to share with our, with our clients and partner with our clients, they didn't get it. So in the 80s I started tweaking the language, and after about three years we came up with a language that we now refer to as the six boxes language, although we didn't call it that for a few years. And it's, it's got a few of Tom's words left, but most of them are pretty different. Mm -hmm. And we used that internally. When we knew we had it right, was we would, I could sit down with a colleague or a client and in 10 minutes or so go through the model and they'd start being able to use it really quickly. 
In fact, I might come back a week or two later and the envelope or whatever that I drew, drew it on would be there and they'd say, I've been using that and then they'd tell me some useful thing. So that was 20 some years ago. We've been using that internally for a long time as one of the tools with our associates and colleagues. But about five years ago, we had a big aha experience, which we recognized that we and our colleagues continue to develop these more powerful, more sophisticated, more complex models and tools. And in some ways are getting harder to apply. They're getting to be more uh, something that just experts know about. And, and you get ex executives or managers look at them and they sort of glaze over. And we realize, wait a minute, if we want to have a big impact, we should pull out these simple models we have, the performance chain in the six boxes model, and we should try to turn them into products. Mm -hmm. So about five years ago, we, we started to focus on what we call the six boxes, but we built a set of tools around it. Uh, the performance chain, which is just, again, it's basic HPT knowledge, but it's a, a visual model that we use to help people understand what performance is. Mm -hmm. And then we help them apply the six boxes model, and then we have a simple logic for <clears throat> basically looking for opportunities for improvement. Etc. And so we've been essentially in an R&D phase for about four or five years with clients trying different programs and so forth. And, and we're finally just literally this week relaunching the business as the performance uh, thinking network. And there's a couple of ideas embedded in that. One of them is that it's really more about getting people to think differently than it is to give them a set of algorithms and tools. Now we've got lots of tools. We can teach you how to apply this technically. But we can also take a supervisor or a manager or an executive or an individual contributor and help them to understand performance and then apply it on the job. So big idea is we're trying to get to, as we say, all levels and all functions in organizations to build a performance-based culture. And the second thing is, I already mentioned, this notion of a network, which when there's this shared language, people start to learn from one another. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the third thing is we had a vision five years ago, but now we got products. Now we can go in and work with an executive team use this language, use some organization mapping, and help them understand strategically where it might make most sense for them to begin to try to improve performance in their organization. We've got a management development program that's very lean and simple, but what we're doing there is we're basically teaching managers to create development plans for their people and their teams using basic HPT concepts, although we don't tell them that, it's just the, so these simple models. And then of course we have programs for practitioners for you know, process improvement, HR, HRD, performance consultants, which use the same models, but of course more technically. And we add coaching to all of these so that we teach people stuff and then we basically coach and we develop coaches internally over time. Mm -hmm. So the big thing that we're trying to do here is to be able to help organizations build a culture of performance and continuous improvement where basically everybody's collaborating rather than sort of we performance improvement specialists becoming the order takers. And that's, we're very excited about that. Very cool, very cool. Do, do you use the HPT term, or do you use some other language when you're generally talking about this, or, or well, do you introduce that and then explain it? We use the word performance improvement a lot. Okay. I always, you know, the, the academic side of me loves human performance technology as a term. I just okay. love it because it's a technology around per human performance. What could be better? You know, it's based on science, et cetera. But as a lot of us have recognized, you know, uh, it doesn't always work that well when we're trying to talk to regular people with that terminology. So we talk about performance improvement and we very quickly get to the performance chain which is simply a visual model which says what is human performance? Well, it's behavior that produces outputs that are valuable because they, have business, they contribute to business results. When you show people the picture they get it pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So we shift as quickly as we can from kind of big talk to simple models that have plain English and examples. Um, and what I find is that that communicates pretty well. We sometimes don't even say, now we're going to show you the model. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll be having a conversation with a client and we'll just slip the language in by saying, well, how do you ex set expectations for your people anyway? And what kind of feedback do they get? And what sort of tools do they use? And they don't know that we're clicking through our little model. Mm -hmm. They just think we're talking plain English. Mm -hmm. So I try to go in that direction when I can. Very good. I've, I've noticed in uh, looking at some of the ISBI chapter sites that you've been making some rounds or you're, you're, you're starting to present your workshop at yeah. some of the chapters. Mm -hmm. For those who are in ISBI or ASED or any other professional mm -hmm. society that might want to take advantage of this, what could you tell us about the, the workshop and the variations? Okay. Do you have half day, full day, sure. those kinds of things? Well, there's a couple things about that. First of all, as a long time ago former chapter president, um, one of the things I believe strongly is that if chapters can get their marketing thing together, 
bringing in external people to do interesting workshops, especially if they're valuable and perceived as valuable by the, by the participants, is a great way to build up the credibility of the chapter, is a great way to provide, you know, I usually do a, a, a profit sharing thing with the chapters, so chapters can make some money, increase their treasury, mm -hmm. and so I'm really encouraging chapters to do that, not just with me, but with other people. The frustration is that because chapters are, are, are volunteer organizations, often they don't get their marketing act together. So mm -hmm. a lot of times we've set up things with chapters and then, oops, they didn't do the work needed to get the word out, they didn't connect up with other associations to bring their members in and so mm -hmm. forth. But be that as it may, we have been, uh, I mean I've done this on and off for years, but in the last year we've worked with five or six chapters and we've got a few more on the list. And what we typically do is our basic, we have this basic program called Introduction to Performance Thinking. And it's not really intended to teach people a lot of technical application. Uh, in fact, when we run it in a company, we can run it for 100 or 200 people and we encourage them to bring business stakeholders, performance improvement people, process people, a lot of people together because what we're basically doing is we're teaching, again, the performance chain, the six boxes model, the simple logic, and then lots of different ways you can apply this in management, in performance improvement, in process improvement, implementation, in executive thinking. Because what we're trying to do with that piece is to get people to have a paradigm shift, really, mm -hmm. and to start looking at performance differently. Because what we find is even if we don't teach a lot of technical details about that, and we can't do that in a day anyway, um, uh, they begin to look at the world differently. And they can actually have pretty big impact right there, just, just without a lot of more technical detail. Now, what we've been doing with chapters primarily the best scenario, I think, is when we go in and a chapter has it arranged so we can do an evening talk. Yes. And usually the evening talk is around what are the challenges trying to get performance to be managed effectively organization-wide. And then we think we have a solution with performance thinking and then we offer a workshop the next day. But then beyond that, of course, we have our application workshop, which is a two-day thing plus coaching for practitioners and it digs in pretty deeply independent, you know, if, you, if you've got an organization where you've got some process people or some, some HRD people or some training people, we can basically teach you this stuff in a little bit more technical way and mm -hmm. then coach you through projects. And then of course we've got our management program, which is, that's where it's exciting. Because if we can get, I mean, beside the fact that in any given company there might be 50 performance improvement people and 2,000 managers, right. we can have much bigger penetration of performance thinking, I think, if we can not just get the managers doing it and not just get the performance improvement people, but get them collaborating and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going with our other programs. Very exciting. I'll be looking forward to hearing more about that in the future. Um, one of the things that I'd like to accomplish with this video series is to talk about some of the people from the past, from the back in the days of mm -hmm. NSPI, and, yep. and also some of the current people as well. But. Um, something that personalizes them, makes them more human. Yeah. So do you have a story of about Fred Skinner that you can share with us, something that most people wouldn't know about him and something that can help us understand him as a person, as a, as a well, it's an, Yeah, it's interesting. Dr. Skinner was a very 19th century man, you know. He was born around the turn of the century and at least on the surface of it, despite the fact that I spent a lot of time in his office and, you know, had, a, had the great opportunity to help edit one of his books and stuff, he was a pretty formal fellow, mm -hmm. but he had a kind of a wry sense of humor as well. He also, from what I've heard, had uh, <clears throat> had a kind of a uh, a lusty sense of humor, at least under some circumstances. Um, but the thing about Dr. Skinner is that he really practiced what he preached. That is, that his he applied to his own life the science of behavior, and it was very inspiring because, for example, he he really started out as an author. If you read his life, you know, he wanted to be a novelist. And he spent a year in Greenwich Village before he went to uh, college, or graduate school rather, trying to be a novelist. And he realized he didn't have anything to write. So then he went to graduate school. He was interested in psychology. So he went to Harvard. And he basically invented a natural science of behavior in the process. He was a brilliant man. And then, of course, he spent the rest of his career certainly doing research, but mostly writing. Now, the part that's kind of interesting about him is most of his adult professional life, until the last day he died, or a couple days before he died, he would get up every morning at four o'clock, he had a little place in his basement, it was exactly the same, it was completely built for writing, he had a cumulative record of, ed of, of finished words per day, he managed his own behavior. He used to say, those three hours between four in the morning and seven in the morning are the most important part of my day, 
I'm trying to maximize the number of words I get. The rest of the day is just preparation for that. Hmm. So that's part of Dr. Skinner that was amazing. And also in his personal life, he really tried you know, to be being re more reinforcing. I mean, when I was a graduate, a college student, and I wrote him this maniacal, enthusiastic letter, little did I know, two weeks later, he writes me this, he writes me back. And then about a year later, I happened to be in Cambridge. I went to Cambridge with a friend of mine, Massachusetts. I walked in his office. He recognized me and spent an hour with me. So despite his 19th century kind of, you know, some view people might have of his being a stern fellow or something, it was amazingly outgoing. The last thing about him that was quite interesting, I think, is that he, you know, he, had, he died of, of, of blood cancer. And he used to say it's a rather good disease to have because you don't really feel bad until toward the end. And so the last about year and a half of his life, he w mostly you couldn't go see him. And if you did, you have to wash your hands and stuff. And, and friends and colleagues would go see him occasionally. But a week before he died, he went in, and he'd have his blood changed every two or three weeks. But a week or so before he died, he was given uh, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Psychological Association in Boston. He went and gave a very inspiring talk. He went home, he finished basically his last chapter, and he died something like three days later. Now he, this is, and oh, the other thing about him was the word about how he died, which is, which is that his last word was marvelous. He was very thirsty. Uh, his daughter put a little bit of water on his lips, and he just said marvelous with a big smile and closed his eyes, and that was it. So, in some ways, he was a pretty inspiring fellow. Mm -hmm. um, there are probably others I could talk about. Ogden Lindsley, for example. Yes, I, I, he is on my list for you to mention. Okay, well, Ogden was, uh, Ogden was an amazing fellow also. He, he was one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He was known as Crazy Og to some of his friends. He and Tom Gilbert, in fact, were friends when they were both at Harvard, and they would go on pretty wild drinking binges and stuff together, and both of them were pretty wild and crazy, brilliant people. But one of the things that people don't know about Ogden is that he was, he was a, I think, a gunner, if I'm not mistaken, in bombers in the Second World War. And he was shot down a couple of times behind enemy lines and escaped from, escaped from uh, prison, Nazi prison camps. And, you know, he'd make his way across the country, and he used to tell stories about doing tricks on the Nazi guards and stuff. But one of the things he told me was, that when he was going down, you know, the first time his plane was going down, he, uh, he, he, like, he was not a religious man, but he sort of prayed. He said, look, if I make it through this, I'm going to spend half of my life having fun because I know my buddies who died would want that to happen and the other half helping people. So when he got out and he got home, he, he got into originally Brown University and then Harvard and he studied with Skinner. But basically Ogden spent the rest of his life maniacally focused on trying to improve education and therapy and psychiatry and a whole bunch of areas through behavior science and the other time playing music and dancing and having fun and being an outrageous character and so he really lived this incredibly full life uh, combining science with a really good time and anybody who knew him here would probably know that I mean mm -hmm. he you know, he's very direct. He was very humorous. He one of the best things he ever did for me was we were at an ISPI conference once, and uh, I just given a presentation, and uh, I was fairly young in my career at the time, and we were going up an escalator, and uh, I'm starting to be self-deprecating. He said that was pretty good, and I start saying, well, actually, it wasn't. You know, Ogden, I should have done this and this, and he just looked at me. He said, would you please shut up and just say thank you? You know, in some ways, that was the best feedback I ever got in my professional <laughs> career. What about some more of our uh, more contemporary members? Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Eskew, you two. Tim, Tim is a great friend. Um, one of the things about Tim is he's very thoughtful. He's very, um, he's a deep thinker, and he's a good writer. He loves to write. But what I like about Tim is how he's able to take things and elegantly boil them down. And so, for example, and I think, I think to some extent his work and his personality, you know, they, they link up pretty nicely because one of the things I, I talk about Tim's book making an impact a lot. And by the way, you were talking about books earlier. Yes. If I were going to recommend a book to anybody at any level, that would be one of them. Making an Impact is this very simple book and it's what we would call box one in the six boxes model. It's about expectations and feedback. And what Tim says, and he learned this I think partly from Bill Daniels, but what Tim says is 
To say that something is being managed, three conditions have to be in place. There have to be crystal clear expectations and goals. There have to be continuous feedback, not to the manager of the person, not to the organization, but directly to the performer. And thirdly, then there has to be control of resources, that is the ability to make decisions and change stuff if you're not achieving the expectations. Mm -hmm. So instead of going in and doing a big needs analysis, like most of us would do, to try to do cause, root cause analysis or this, that, or the other thing, Tim just goes into an organization and says, how many people are working under those three conditions? And of course, we know most people aren't. Mm -hmm. most, most workplaces or even home lives don't have those three conditions operating continuously. So what he does is he works with organizations to put that, those conditions in place. And, and, and making an impact is really all, it's this little thin book elegantly written um, with practical recommendations about how to make that happen. And to me, that the book is a reflection of Tim's kind of, he's not, he doesn't talk a lot, but when he talks, you ought to listen, because he really has interesting things to say, usually. Good. Thank you. Others, such as, how about a story on, about Tom Gilbert? Well, Tom, oh, actually, wild, I have a guy. wild story about Tom Gilbert. I have to, I have to tell this story, actually. In uh, sometime in the mid '90s, not too many years before he died, Tom, as most people know, had a, had a somewhat of a reputation for drinking and partying quite a bit most of his life, and and uh, or at least that's the story. And I didn't know it directly that much, but one of the last times I saw Tom, we were at an ISPI conference, and I knew Tom pretty well, you know, and I had some clients at a big biotech company that were longtime clients, and I was probably trying to impress them a little bit. I don't know, but anyway. I, they happened to be there and Tom was there, so I offered to take Tom and, and a couple of my clients and one of the people who was working for me to dinner, along with um, a Jim, uh, oh I forget his last name, I, I should remember his last name, but a, an old program instruction guy who was an old friend of Tom's and also kind of a partier. And um, anyway, we went out to dinner and it was pretty nice and the only thing was that Tom and Jim kept ordering drinks, you know. And I was getting a little nervous because I was paying the bill, but also I was kind of, you know, I was sort of enabling these guys, and I was getting a little bit concerned, you know, and Tom was getting more effusive and so forth. So finally we kind of wrapped up the dinner, and we all parted, and everything was fine, you know, and I went up to my room. So the next morning, Jim Evans, that was his name. So the next morning, I come down to the lobby, and, uh, and the lobby, I forget where the hotel was, but it had a big hot, it had these kind of large marble things that were maybe five feet tall, and they were kind of like uh, walls, but they were kind of decorative in the, in the front lobby. So anyway, uh, so I say to Tom, oh, how are you doing this morning? He said, oh, I'm doing fine. And he said, uh, and, and I said, how did things go last night? He said, great. He said, but he said, the only thing is Jim, Jim got up in one of those things, and we were talking, and he fell off and cracked his head open. I had to go to the hospital, and I said, "Oh my gosh!" I, well, you know, I felt responsible. I said, "Oh my gosh!" I'm really sorry to hear that. And Tom says, "Oh no, don't worry. It happens all the time." <laughs> and so I put everything to, into perspective for me. But Tom was a brilliant man who, even when he was under those conditions, the ideas that would pop out of his—they they were always innovative. They were always, you know, I think it's partly the reasons that all of us, uh, you know, even people who weren't that happy about some of Tom's quote personal behavior. You couldn't not listen to the man. He was such a brilliant person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So he was a good one. Let me shift a little bit here to the society itself. What would your vision be for ISPI five or ten years out from now? How, how would you envision it to be different or the same? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer to that. One of the things that I think is that I think, I think a few years ago, when a lot of the kind of founders were still very active, Gilbert, Rumler, uh, you know, a lot of the people who've now uh, passed away and along with this, Bob Mager and so forth, I think that there was a pretty strong connection between what performance te how te performance technology was defined and the scientific roots of what we do. Mm -hmm. And when I say the scientific roots, I really do mean behavior science uh, coming from Skinner and that whole world to a large extent. Although, that's not to say that cognitive science and other fields haven't made really important contributions here. Mm -hmm. But there was a pretty strong focus on performance defined as behavior producing valuable results, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And there was even, I think, a pretty clear understanding about what you know Gilbert and Harless and others have called the accomplishment-based approach, which is to focus on the outputs of behavior before you go to 
the behavior itself. Mm -hmm. um, I th what my understanding then of what performance technology was was about the application of that understanding to improving performance. I think what's occurred over the years is as the organization has grown in different ways, and as different as we've tried to encourage people from other fields and other backgrounds to come in, I think it's gotten to be a more eclectic organization. And so I think one of the reasons that uh, up until not too many years ago, the basic models were how we define what performance technology was. And then at some point, uh, it became defined more as a set of principles, a set of guidelines, which are, you know, like partnering and doing front end analysis mm -hmm. and being systemic and all that. And while I think those are all important things, the challenge is that they can apply to almost anything that's systematic. And so the question is, what is the scope of the organization? And what I ask, when I ask myself that, I say, what has it been for me? For me, it's been a place where a lot of smart people who, who have a lot of technical skills and expertise and a lot of experience have provided me with learning and an opportunity to network and understand more and more about performance. So along those lines, I would like to see the organization continue to grow. I would like to see it get bigger. Um, I would like to see a continued focus on those principles, but what the puzzle about it is, is much like the American Psychological Association, as it gets bigger and as there are more and more sort of subsets of different expertise and theories and philosophies, it becomes more of a collection of people who are all kind of interested in having an impact but its definition gets harder and harder to put your arms around, I think. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually know the answer to that. What I would like to see, though, is that, um, for example, uh, one, one thing I think that could be very important. We talk a lot about measurement, but I don't see a lot of data. Um, what I've been told is that in the early days, and I'm as much to blame as anybody else, but what I, you know, I've been told in the early days of NSPI, if you didn't have some data to show at your presentation, you got maybe not laughed, but you certainly didn't get, you know, or hooked off the stage, but you didn't get a lot of positives. Let's put or, it that or the way. audience would get up and leave. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, now it's the exception rather than the rule. And mm -hmm. often the data that we show are, are subjective or they're survey data. Nothing wrong with that. But, for example, I would like to see... I would like to see research in HPT not about what people think research should be or how practitioners do stuff. I would like to see it about projects that show results. I would like to see performance improvement quarterly have articles in it which are about actual performance improvement projects and how we did it. So that the field became a little bit more based on a foundation of what works and what doesn't based on the real results. And I think I'd like to see a stronger some way to make more presentations at the conferences like that too. But I honestly don't know how to get there from here because, because that is not the trend. The trend seems to be, um, you know, and I'm, you know, I just showed some su subjective survey uh, uh, data in a presentation I did the other day and that's great information. I try to show data about the results of what we do too. But I think we need to somehow move in that direction. And so for me the future would be if we can somehow make measurement more practical and accessible to a larger number of people in the, so in, the, in the society so that we see more data. But I don't know if that's a vision for how to do it. I think it's just kind of what I'd, a dream I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. Well, I share that with you. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that with us. Thank you for this interview. Well, thank you, guys.